Testing. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. Testing, one, two, three, testing, 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 can you hear me? Testing, testing, testing.
Testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, testing. Testing, one, two, three, testing, 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 testing. Testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, testing. Can you hear it? Testing. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, testing. Testing. Testing, 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 one, two, three, testing, can you hear me? Testing, 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 testing. Testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. Testing, 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 one, two, three, testing. Can you hear me? Testing, testing, testing. Testing, testing, hello, 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 testing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Captioning systems having problems.
Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to UC Berkeley's 2019 Grad Slam competition. For those who don't know me, um, I'm, my name is Fiona Doyle, and I'm the Vice Provost for Graduate Studies and Dean of the Graduate Division. Um, I'm particularly pleased that today's event, by coincidence, is actually happening during Graduate and Professional Student Appreciation Week. So it's a lovely way to appreciate all of our graduate students on this campus. So I'd ask everybody who isn't a graduate student here to join me in a little round of appreciation for all the grad students who are here. I'd also like to extend sincere thanks to the College of Engineering for making this lovely auditorium available to us. Um, it's a step up from um, the room that we have in the graduate division. Um, and last year, we actually couldn't accommodate all of the audience, um, so we needed some bigger digs. This is a lovely place to hold this. The only downside of, of having it here is that I have to ask you not to eat or drink um, other than water while you're here here um, because we don't want to ruin the lovely furnishings um, but I know that you can manage that. So the Grad Slam competition was um, launched five years ago by President um, Janet Napolitano of the UC system and the purpose of the event is to encourage graduate students to sharpen a different aspect of their professional skills, namely the ability to express in a very clear, succinct way to a general audience what they're doing. Many of you who are used to having conversations with graduate students will know that they can give you incredibly detailed um, discussions on what it is that they're doing. I remember when I asked my mother to proofread my dissertation, she said, um, and, and she was very good at doing this because she had no idea what it was about. So she read each word very carefully and found lots of typos that everybody else had omitted. And she said, oh, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Or something along those lines. Because I didn't have the skill of expressing to her in three minutes what it was that I was doing. So um, the competition is indeed a, um, a three-minute discussion of what people are doing. The way that the system-wide competition works is that each campus is asked to identify a finalist. And our finalist is identified in two different rounds. So earlier in the year, all the graduate students um, at Berkeley were invited to submit a video, um, a three-minute video, um, providing this um, general um, t a talk for a general audience on what they're doing. And those submissions were judged by um, the faculty subcommittee of the Graduate Council on professional development. And I'm sure that, that job was incredibly difficult. And I'd like to acknowledge now Elena Konis here, the chair of that group. She's also the vice chair of the Graduate Council for leading the faculty in that difficult um, undertaking. And that yielded the 10 finalists from whom we're going to hear this afternoon, they're all sitting in the front row. Um, the um, competitors were motivated by prize money, as well as the glory <laughs> and the professional <laughs> development. <laughs> but, the, but the prize money is, is, is not inconsequential, let's say, in providing a motivating factor. So all of our competitors today will receive at least $100, and then we will have three winners, the People's Choice, Second, and thir First Place finalists, each of whom will receive $750, $1,000, and $3,000 respectively. Um, the first place winner will represent uh, Berkeley at the UC-wide competition um, next month, that's May 10th in San Francisco at the LinkedIn headquarters, competing for additional prize money. So there's a good thing going. So how are we going to identify um, the lucky winners today? Um, well, it's not going to be luck. It's on the basis of careful evaluation of their presentations. And so it's now my pleasure to introduce to you the panel of judges who has the very, very difficult um, task of actually making the evaluation. And I'd ask our judges if each of you could um, stand when I introduce you. 
um, in um, alphabetical order, um, we have Bjorn Hartmann, who is um, the faculty director of the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation and an associate professor of electrical engineering and computer science. Um, we have um, Lawrence Johnson, who earned his BS in biz business administration here in 72, um, and he is the chair of the graduate division's executive advisory committee. And our third judge is Wendy Takuda, who is a former KPIX um, news anchor and a speech coach. So please join me in thanking our coaches. <laughs> They're vol volunteering their time to do this difficult job, and I'm so grateful to them for that. And then... In addition to this panel, you also are judges. I mentioned that there is a People's Choice um, Prize, and you, the, the audience members, will be the um, judges of that. Uh, we will, um, at the end of the presentations, be giving you the information on how you, you vote for the People's Choice. We're not doing it now because you need to hear all the presentations before you can fairly evaluate them all. Um, but I would encourage you to make any notes um, on your programs or wherever else you make notes um, of, about the different um, presentations so that you can make an informed um, vote for the people's choice. Um, and so with that, um, I'm now pleased to introduce to you and welcome back to Berkeley, last year's winner, um, Dr. Joe Charbonnet. Um, not only did he win the, comp the campus um, competition, but he also won the system-wide competition, which means that this year Berkeley is the um, defending champion. No pressure on the contestants <laughs> here. <laughs> Um, but um, Joe completed his PhD in 2018 in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here, basically just through that wall and a bit up. Um, and his dissertation research focused on developing technologies to remove toxic contaminants from stormwater. He also received his master's degree um, in civil and environmental engineering here and his bachelor's degree in the same field from Georgia Tech. He is now a science and policy associate at the Green Science Policy Institute, exemplifying one of the other things that we care about deeply in the graduate division, which is professional development for following a um, varied um, range of different careers. So um, John, uh, uh, Joe has very kindly um, joined us to share his reflections on the value of event, um, what it meant to him and his perspective a year later. So welcome back. Bill. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, I will start out by saying I recognize the irony of having an additional speaker at an event dedicated to brevity. So I'll be quick. <laughs> um, as Fiona mentioned, uh, my claim to fame around here is being the defending champion for this event. But in the meantime, I've actually finished my PhD, so I'm tempted to just talk to the grad students about the sublime ecstasy that comes from finally, <laughs> finally being done with your PhD. But, but instead, I will talk about something that seems a little bit more salient and that came up a lot during my Grad Slam experience last year. And that was this question of what is the value of a pitch contest for students who aren't scientists or engineers. Now, I'm really excited to get to know this year the contestants from the social sciences and the humanities, but in my experience last year with fellow competitors from those fields, I found they often described feeling somewhat out of place in this kind of forum. Um, you know, I am a dyed-in-the-wool, hardcore, nerdy engineer. I am passionate about the Navier-Stokes equation. I propose to my wife using a first edition of Newton's Principia. And it is so cool. It's so cool that people are willing to pay a lot of money for the expertise that I love to provide. But I'm not convinced that just because someone else can make money off of what I do, it makes my studies any more valuable or my passion any less sincere than someone who's studying, say, 
the beauty of a Neruda poem or how libraries provide community spaces for things like marriage proposals. Uh, I, I think that all that this says is that I'm quite lucky that my heart happened to lie in a technical field. I think we need to abolish this myth that the value of pitch contests is that they prepare students for a chance elevator ride with a venture capitalist who has more money than ideas. Um, the dean might not like hearing this, but I think even in the hallowed halls here at Berkeley, opportunities like that are vanishingly rare. I think the real value of pitch contests, especially for students who may not be inclined to entrepreneurship or may not be in a technical field, is because they teach us to connect with just normal people. They give you a chance to explain to others and to remind yourself why you fell in love with a subject so deeply that you're willing to live in a converted garden shed for five years <laughs> while you study this. They give you a chance to respond to those people who say that academics are elite or out of touch by showing your humanity and your, hum and your humor. They let you show how the work that all of us in this community do is worthwhile. And I say this as a sanitation engineer, even beautiful. People really connect with that. I now work for this amazing think tank in Berkeley called the Green Science Policy Institute, where I do science communication for a living. That's right, contestants. This isn't just a competition today. People will actually pay you to do this in real life. And the work that we study at Green Science Policy is pretty heavy stuff. We look at toxic chemicals that can make us sick. But when we talk about it, we do it in ways that are simple and optimistic and sympathetic and even funny. And it helps us to make allies out of enemies and believers out of policymakers and even occasional environmentalists out of Republicans. <laughs> and, so, and so in a shameless plug, I'm going to, to ask you to uh, consider signing up for our newsletter um, because it is a way that you can learn. I'm, I'm going to send this around. There's also, there's also one out at the side there. So this is a way. Th this is a way that in, in a form that is at least twice as entertaining as this talk and three times more informative, you can learn every month about something that really impacts your life and you don't even have to look at my crooked nose while you get it. Um, but I'm also going to use this opportunity to exhort the contestants here today. This is, this is really about you. That even if you feel, especially if you feel out of place in a forum like this, don't just view today as a competition. View this as a model for how you talk about your research going forward every day from now, including in academic settings. Because when people see your passion, and they see your enthusiasm, and they see the wonder and magic that comes from the way that you talk about and you study the things that you're dedicating your life to, I think that will give you more validation than any handshake in an elevator ever could. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. You can understand why <laughs> he, he was hard to beat at, <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the competition. So um, we're about to begin our presentations. Um, I just wanted to let you know that our speakers, the order of speakers, has been randomized so that nobody has an advantage or a disadvantage by virtue of their last name. Um, so and so it's, it appears random because it is random. Um, and we, which means we'll be switching from one topic to another, which will also keep things very interesting. Um, each contestant is going to have three minutes, as, you, as you've heard, to present their research. Um, where the judges will be following the same guidelines that are used in the system-wide competition, um, judging presentations on their intellectual significance, the appropriateness, clarity, organization, engagement, delivery, and visuals and points will be deducted for every three seconds that exceed three minutes. We have a, a clock at the front here, so um, people will know when they're getting close to that. Um, in between each presentation, the judges will be doing their evaluation. 
And while that is going on, I will be asking the each um, contestant a few general questions um, so that you can learn a bit more about them. And they'll be very relaxed at that point because they will have finished their actual talk. Um, so we might have some interesting, um, we might learn some interesting things about our contestants. And then, as I said before, after all 10 of them, we'll have the people's choice um, judging. Um, we will then, as an audience, convene um, for some light refreshments in the lobby um, while the judges do the hard work of actually selecting our winners. So with that, it's my pleasure to invite our first contestant, um, Yifan Lee, um, to come forward. He's already here. Um, he is a fifth year PhD student in chemistry. Um, so take it away. What can we make by joining multiple carbon atoms together along with some hydrogen and oxygen from water? Well, if you have two carbons, you can make alcohol. And with three, you can make propane. With six, sugars. Eight, aspirin. And as you add more carbon atoms, you can start making products like diesel, detergent, plastics, pharmaceuticals. All of these products are built from multiple carbon atoms being bonded together multi-carbons. And we get these multi-carbons in the worst way imaginable. See, carbon dioxide, CO2, is a molecule with a single carbon atom. Nature has devised a method to turn CO2 into multi-carbons with a little water and sunlight for energy. She calls the process photosynthesis. Now, nature is the most patient chemist I know. She's been running this reaction for millions of years, turning CO2 into biomass, into fossil fuels, burying it deep underground until we dig it up to get our multi-carbon fix. That means we rely on a million-year reaction to get the multi-carbons that build our society and economy. And as we burn these fossil fuels and convert them to the products we need, we take the extra carbon and release it back into the atmosphere as greenhouse gas. But what if we could speed up nature's reaction to take days or hours instead of millions of years? Build a fast track through photosynthesis that would remove our reliance on fossil fuels. Well, to start doing that, you need the right arrangement of atoms that can take two CO2 molecules and bond them together. We call that the catalyst. In my research, I study tiny catalysts called nanocrystals where the arrangement of atoms can be precisely controlled. I put these nanocrystals underwater, surrounded by CO2, and run electricity through them. By observing which structures create the most multi-carbons, I learn what defines a good catalyst. What I discovered was that a good catalyst is defined not only by how the atoms are placed, but by how they move. In fact, the faster these nanocrystals scramble around, the more multi-carbons are produced, including molecules like ethanol and ethylene, the precursor to the most common plastic in the world today. We're using these new insights to synthesize improved catalysts that can turn CO2 into valuable multi-carbon products, typically derived from fossil fuels. By understanding how the catalyst directs this chemistry, we expand the scope of products we can make from CO2, water, and renewable electricity. And we do it all without relying on nature's million-year reaction, putting us on the fast track to photosynthesis. Thank you. So thank you so much, Ifan. So yeah. um, while the judges do their hard work, and they'll just tune out, and they're not judging you on this, so now you can say whatever you want. Excellent. Um, <laughs> Been looking forward to this part. <laughs> So, so let me ask you, um, where are you from? So I, uh, you I've, moved around, I've moved around a lot in my childhood. Actually, I came to California uh, during grad school, essentially. Uh -huh. I mostly I'm grew up. brought you here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mostly grew up in Rockville, Maryland, near the DC area. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's where I spent a lot of my time. OK, so you had to get away from all the politicians. Away from the politicians, <laughs> away from the mosquitoes. Oh, that's okay. the big thing. <laughs> and, and how long have you been interested in chemistry? 
Oh, well, I've been are, interested are you, some, are you somebody who was kind of, you know, making bombs um, when you, <laughs> your parents thought you were, um, you know, sort of quietly reading a book? No. Or did you develop this passion later in life? I don't know, just, just playing around <laughs> with chemicals, not making bombs. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Um, well, I mean, I was, you know, first I was... I, I was the kind of kid who did make all the explosions. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, no, I, I was first actually interested in dinosaurs and space. Uh-huh. Um, interestingly enough, it's cycled around now where a lot of the chemistry I work on is very relevant to space. Yes. But I first got interested in chemistry, I think, uh, in college, before uh -huh. I was mostly interested in biology. But I got interested because of these kinds of energy problems. Yes. Uh, and I think that as our world continues moving forward, the solutions that chemistry offers, especially materials chemistry, uh, seem really promising to me. I just want to be a part of that effort. Uh -huh. And so you mentioned that your, your, your catalysts are nanocrystals. Yes. Nanocrystals of what? So these specific, uh, they're crystals of copper, which is very interesting because uh -huh. usually catalysts are extremely expensive metals like platinum, gold, rhodium, and, but copper is, you know, copper is everywhere. But yet copper is actually the only element that does this reaction, which is so strange to us and no one's figured out why. Uh, it's amazing. So do you think that copper was important in Mother Nature developing photosynthesis or is this just a coincidence? No, so, I mean, copper isn't, Mother Nature does not use copper for photosynthesis. Uh -huh. uh, she uses much more complicated things. I think, well, we don't know what's going on, really, but it seems like it's an accident that uh -huh. copper works in this way. Very interesting. Yeah. So just to change um, the, sort of the topic, um, because not everybody is a chemistry nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I could, yeah, I could keep talking about this all day. <laughs> yeah, me too, but they'd be really bored, so yeah. let's not do that to them. Um, so what, what um, do you enjoy doing in California that you couldn't do in Maryland? Uh, uh, yes. Um, so it's a very different kind of place, uh, for, quite apart from the absence of mosquitoes, or at least smaller populations. Right. Well, I'll, I'll say that I've discovered several things in California that... I guess do exist in Maryland. They're just not as prevalent, so I didn't discover them back then. Uh -huh. But so um, I occasionally go rock climbing now. Uh -huh. um, that's where something. Go, where do you go climbing? Uh, down in Bridges. Um, uh -huh. It's yeah somewhere. I actually don't really even know. <laughs> <laughs> I always I always get driven there. I don't do the driving. <laughs> I see. So yeah. map reading isn't one of those skills. No, uh -huh. really, really, really uh -huh. not. <laughs> and and uh, what, anything else that you like doing? Um, I think I think just uh, this area of California, especially, is just really nice for the art scene and the theater scene, which uh -huh. I really appreciated. Uh -huh. um, things like around Berkeley, just going to local theaters. Uh -huh. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, you can it's been a pleasure. So our second contestant is Richard Barnes. Richard is a fourth year PhD student in the should, Energy and uh, Resources Group and Electrical yeah. Engineering and Computer Science. Take it away, Richard. In politics, we elect our representatives for two years, our presidents for four, and our senators for six years. But the maps we draw last for 10 years at a time. This gives you an idea of the importance of maps. If political maps are drawn in nefarious ways, a political party can use them to lock in power. As shown here, different maps drawn with the same voter demographics can lead to vastly different political outcomes. Drawing maps in this way is called gerrymandering, and my research aims to prevent it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, Mathematicians measure shapes using a quantity known as compactness. If a district is too contorted, it's often thought of as having been gerrymandered. Therefore, one way to prevent gerrymandering is to have a computer measure the shape of districts and to reject those which are not compact enough. In my research, I found that even this seemingly simple measurement requires many choices. What map projection should be used? What if districts have islands? Any set of choices will lead to a measure of compactness. However, many equally valid measures would have arose had different choices been made. Similarly, if we have a computer instead draw districts by uh, choosing only simple, fair arrangements of lines, 
what we're left with is districts that, in theory, are not affected by politics or by race, the factors that drive gerrymandering. Instead, we have districts that should be fair. However, in my research, I have found that these districts tend to divide communities and to disenfranchise minorities. Furthermore, for technical reasons, such uh, computers need to use randomness in order to draw such districts. And this means that political representation can come down to what are essentially coin flips. Many states take a kind of Council of Elrond approach to drawing their districts. Elite representatives gather at a plush resort, argue and use their keen powers to draw districts without human input. The methods I explore ask whether it's possible to use simple computational methods in order to prevent gerrymandering. And I found out that mostly that's not possible. So with the next redistricting in just three years, what can we do? There are massive asymmetries in power between the people who draw districts and the public affected by them. If we are to cast gerrymandering into the fires of Mordor, we need to give the public access to tools and information so they can have a seat at the table too. Thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, um, how did you get interested in this topic? And um, I've got to ask, what, what does this have to do with energy and resources? <laughs> well, this is the and in energy and resources. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got. In <laughs> um, I was having some feelings after the last election. Um, <laughs> I think a few of us <laughs> can join you in that sentiment. Um, and I, the, there was a group out at uh, MIT and Tufts University that were interested in how people involved with mathematics and computer science could uh, play a role in trying to reduce um, the effect that gerrymandering has on our democracy. Uh -huh. Because essentially this allows politicians a way to, uh, to choose who they represent rather than us choosing who represents us. And so you've talked about some of the things that don't work. It's, it's interesting because you have talked about not being a math person. You clearly are a math <laughs> person. Um, you've said that, that it sounds as though at the moment you don't actually have a solution. Is well, that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that is correct. <laughs> well, well, kind of. So, so are you going to come up with one before the next election? Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I, I think that a lot of people uh, who are involved with computer science and mathematics, when they think about this problem, what arises in their mind first is simple methods. Um, these are Voronoi diagrams. It's just the simplest way you would solve this problem. Or maybe we can take what people draw and we can limit it. Um, the problem is that these ideas haven't been well evaluated. And so what I've been doing is I've been taking suggestions that have been forwarded by the community that haven't been well explored, and I've been checking to see, like, does this work, does this work? And with each simple method we rule out, we're left with more complex alternatives that incorporate more human values. That is, we're left with methods that are easier to game. I think that uh, when you look at the way districts are drawn, states with independent commissions and states that try to effectively insulate the gerrymandering process from their politics tend to experience less gerrymandering. Similarly, states that have a role for the public to get involved with the process, um, they experience better outcomes for certain communities. For instance, Minneapolis was able to give their Somali community access to the tools that they use to draw maps there. And this led to Somalis for the first time having representation on the Minneapolis City Council. And so I think giving people access to tools and information so they can draw maps as well is a way of balancing out the power of people versus the power of the government. I see. So um, what part of your upbringing prepared you for this kind of work? Were you, were you, were you, always, were you always interested in mathematics? Um, or did you come to this later? Um, I, I think it's just been an area that's always fascinated me, fascinated uh -huh. me to some degree, and it, it took a long time to settle down on this. I went through a whole degree in philosophy before arriving at mathematics. Uh -huh. Well, the two are uh, actually quite closely related. Well, that's what you'd think, but I did, I did my philosophy in ethics, uh -huh. and so maybe it's... Uh... <laughs> well, well, actually, that's a good idea. Given what yeah. you're doing, that's not a bad way to approach it. Well, and, and I think that motivates a lot of problems you choose, right? There's yes. an infinite realm of problems you can choose to work on, but what your ethics are, what your social awareness is, that kind of determines the direction you take your skills. Uh -huh. Okay, well, I
it looks like the judges are done. Thank so you so thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So our third contestant is Sarah Ann Knutsen, who is in her third year um, doing a PhD in Scandinavian and anthropology. Sarah Ann. Four years ago, a TV series got hacked. The show Homeland hired graffiti artists to help recreate a refugee camp because no one involved with the show bothered to learn Arabic. The episode went on air, and viewers discovered that the artists had written intentional messages, including Homeland is a watermelon, an insult meaning that the show is a joke. Now you may think that the irony of a series that intends to depict Arab culture without understanding the language is obvious. Now what if I told you that there is an entire part of world history that is often ignored because few English-speaking scholars can read Arabic. The extensive global connections between the Arab world and Europe were as much a reality a thousand years ago as they are today. But how do we piece together a past that is not yet written down in history books? Well, two years ago, I met a girl who came to California as a refugee. She carries, at all times, the key to her house in Syria, a daily promise that one day she will return home. As an archeologist, I study objects like this key. I research polyethnic objects that moved between the Arab world to Europe a thousand years ago. Now these objects face contested claims of ownership between communities, museums, and even governments. As an academic, I see it as my role and a privilege to mediate these perspectives by communicating. Much like the film set, it is not enough, and it might even be dangerous, to study cultural interactions without involving communities who have a claim to this heritage. Cross-cultural interactions have the power to illuminate how we construct our cultural identities. The urgency of this work is to break down this narrative of us versus them. How do we challenge this narrative and better resolve current social issues today? I believe the answer is to start by looking at the ways in which we have moved, interacted, and shared common experiences, both in the past as well as today. Thank you. <laughs> well done, Sarah. Thank um, you. So how did you get interested in archaeology, and yeah. partic particularly um, I, I'm really struck by your um, linkage between the past and today. Yeah. Which, um, and, and I'm interested in how common that approach is in contemporary archaeology. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely something that is more part of archaeology now than it was even uh -huh. 50 years ago. Um, yeah, I've always been really interested in traveling, learning from people who are, come from a very different background, very different culture than me. Um, so yeah, I've, I just I was drawn to this project because it allows me to not only travel to many places, um, speak many languages, um, but it also just allows me to really like get into like these different cultures and see how they communicated in the past, mm -hmm. um, especially over like this history that so many people don't know about. So I've got to ask you, how many languages do you speak? All right, I'll read. Okay, <laughs> read, yeah, read is probably a better question. Um, to varying degrees of proficiency, I speak about 10 languages. Wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a linguist, which is why I still talk like this. The <laughs> years have to go. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm lost in admiration. Thank <laughs> you. And so where did you grow up, Sarah Ann? Yeah, I grew up on the west side of Michigan, so uh -huh. 
closer to Chicago than Detroit. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I was born in Grand Rapids. Oh, okay. Um, I actually have um, in-laws around there, so okay. I, I, I do know it. Yeah. So did you go to school um, as an undergraduate in Michigan? Or did I did. Did you come west or east or something? Yeah, no, I did my undergrad at the University of Michigan and uh -huh. then went to England for a year and then moved to California. Uh -huh. And so how did you end up in Scandinavian studies? Was it kind of from that Midwestern? Maybe. Or was it just that, um, you just found it fascinating. Yeah, I mean, so my ancestors come from Norway. So uh -huh. I've always been fascinated, especially by the Vikings, because they were the great travelers of their day. Um, and I think that's one reason that I was sort of drawn, firstly, to Scandinavia before sort of looking outwards and the places that they've traveled. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, they're my ancestors as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but we, were, we were the Irish brands. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> and so... Um, so what's your impression of California now that you've been here a few uh, years? It uh, looks, uh, and you've traveled a lot, so you've yeah. got a lot to compare it with. I love it. I, I love the diversity of it. Yes. And of course, the weather is amazing. Uh -huh. I will never go back to Michigan winters, but <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's been amazing. Uh -huh. And so what, um, what would be something that somebody would be really surprised to know about you? Okay. <laughs> um, Depends how well you know me. Uh, <laughs> I'm a triathlete. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Last year, I competed in the Escape from Alcatraz triathlon, so oh. I have swam across the San Francisco Bay. And yes. And then how much did you have to run and bike? As well? Yeah, I don't remember the bike. I think it was something like 40 kilometers, and then it was an eight-mile run. Wow. So it, it takes a while. That's pretty impressive. Thank well, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>so our fourth contestant is michael vance who is in his first year um, doing a phd in ethnomusicology michael in jewish religious practice there is a phenomenon called the nigun which is a wordless melody which is a wordless melody that uh, is often sung when people come together. It is sung without any words, often on one syllable, a ni or a di, and it is sung repetitively so that it is very easy for pretty much anybody to participate. It is said that the nigun begins to take on a life of its own after it gets going, and that the singers instinctively respond to the needs of the nigun. People have an inherent need for community. It doesn't matter how introverted you may be. There is a consensus among anthropologists and psychologists and many other professionals who say that close-knit social interactions are fundamental to being a human being. And in today's age of globalization, a lot of people are feeling a lack of these communities. No wonder there's an in, a rise in initiatives of, uh, of companies trying to bring people together. People feel too linked in and synced up with their technology. So they are looking beyond their contemporary realities to other times and places they once felt a sense of belonging. And they are doing so through the phenomenon of heritage tourism. Uh, heritage tourism is not exactly a new phenomenon, but it is the focus of my research now, and it is a phenomenon designed to uh, market trips to diasporic ethnic groups to places they consider to be their homelands. In particular, I, I would like to research how music is used in, within heritage tourists to create new senses of community among people who might not have necessarily met each other before or who go on to or who go to a new place. It's not so easy to build community like this. You, it's not just that you get on a plane and fly to some place that you've never been to before. You need something else really, something that can speak to the soul, to convey pure emotions without any sense of pretense. Because at the end of the day, emotions can, can build community in a way that thoughts could only aspire to. 
So for my research, I'm spending much of my academic career focusing on music in heritage tourism, specifically in the case of Jewish heritage tourism to Israel, but in other contexts as well, Ireland, Morocco. And I asked the question, what exactly, how exactly does music recreate communities? In a world of, that is divisive as it is today, we owe it to ourselves to bring people together. Thank you. So congratulations, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'm fascinated. Um, did you come into this area from um, a background where you were focusing primarily on music? Or have you had, or did you come in from it, to it from sort of a more of an anthropology perspective? Uh, more of an anthropology perspective. I already have a bachelor's in anthropology yes. from Tufts. And I have a master's in international relations from the University of Chicago. Uh -huh. But I am a musician. I'm a violinist. I specialize in Eastern European Jewish music and also Arabic classical music. Uh -huh. um, and uh, when, I was in, when I was in high school, I was, a, I was a big klezmer fiddler. Uh -huh. And um, I was thinking, there's got to be something. I would love to be able to study, like, is there such a thing like ethno music? Ecology or something like that, and as it turns out, there actually is. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, so I decided to jump for it at some uh -huh. point. Yeah. So, um, sort of from a, a, an anthropological perspective, mm -hmm. how far back does um, the record indicate that people have been making music or singing Ooh. and so on? Uh, I, if you think if this is hard, I've got an even harder question. I mean, <laughs> I mean, but how long? It's, it's, some, it's something that has really interested me, um, because the fossil record may actually not be particularly, you know, you know the uh, whatever it is. It's not fossils. Um, the artifact record um, may be kind of a bit weak on this, right? Well, not necessarily. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I'm not an archaeologist, but uh -huh. there's, I mean, as far as there, are, there's all kinds of records of different. I mean, there's remnants of some musical instruments that have been found from thousands and thousands of years ago. As uh -huh. far as I know, between that and cave paintings, there are records of people making music from the beginnings of, of recorded history, at uh -huh. least in some way. And so um, I, the sort of hard question uh -huh. <laughs> is, you know, I've, I've been sort of thinking of whether there are any other animals that make music. And so oh, clearly songbirds and things um, make music. Uh -huh. But is there any evidence of, say, any other primates communicating or creating community? Well, that is a very interesting sort of, question. Um, getting together and making noise of some There's nation. actually somebody else in my program uh -huh. who specializes in uh, orangutans and their perceptions of metal music in Indonesia. Uh -huh. Seriously. Yes. Seriously. <laughs> And it's fascinating stuff. I honestly yes. don't, I don't know nearly enough about that to be able to speak about it. But I know that people study it. And like there's, there's other ethnomusicological works about, you know, I would say maybe more about humans and how they are interpreting soundscapes around them, uh -huh. whether it's bird songs or even interpreting nature as, uh, as music in some way. Uh -huh. Yeah. Which brings to mind um, my area of specialization is on more the mining, um, mining, you know, just <laughs> very, very different. Um, <laughs> one of the things we have to worry about is keeping wildlife away from toxic sites. Mm -hmm. And um, apparently the most, for many migratory birds, the most effective deterrent is playing heavy metal music at very loud <laughs> volumes. <long. laughs> <laughs> so all of these bird scares and things are, are when they, they pay out comparison wow. to the effect of, um, you know, ACDC or something. Interesting. <laughs> so thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, our fifth contestant is Nancy Freitas. Um, Nancy is a first-year student in the Energy and Resources group. Nancy. Thank you. What if I told you that bacteria, those tiny microbes we can't even see with the naked eye, 
are in part responsible for some of the largest climate changes that we are seeing around the planet. Changes that we are all familiar with, like the wildfires ripping through our backyards right here in Northern California. Would you believe me? Bacteria are small, it's true, but they participate in the global carbon cycle, which means that they have a similar ability to participate in global climate change. But let's take a step back. I work up in the Arctic where, this will surprise nobody, it's cold. <laughs> and there are areas of ground that have been permanently frozen for tens of thousands of years. That means that microbes in this ground have been inactive or dormant for the same amount of time. But as soon as climate change hits and this permafrost begins to thaw, those microbes wake up and they start eating all of the unfrozen plant material that's now available to them. And unfortunately for humans, two of the waste products that microbes can produce when they do this are carbon dioxide and methane, potent greenhouse gases if released to the atmosphere. And if you consider the fact that in a single spoonful of soil, there exist about a billion bacteria, and you spread that across the entire Arctic, that is a lot of greenhouse gas that could be released to the atmosphere. But I'm not studying all microbes in the Arctic. I'm specifically looking at microbes in lake sediment. And the reason for this is that lakes currently cover about 40% of the area of the Arctic but we're not sure how they're going to change. Um, and this means that a lot of our global climate models do not incorporate lakes. So models that look like these could be missing a major source of potential warming in our future projections. Now the reason this is important is that if we can make these models more accurate and more representative of potential climate scenarios, then our legislators can call upon them to make climate adaptation strategies that are rooted in scientific knowledge. Now, I know that talking about climate change can be a little bit discouraging, but climate change is not a done deal. If microbes, which are so incredibly small, have the potential to impact global carbon cycling, then surely humans, which are much larger and much smarter than microbes, can have a similarly large effect if we collectively mitigate our impact on the planet. We just need to start having these conversations right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. So I, I was so pleased that you ended on such a positive note because I looked at your map and I was feeling quite depressed. <laughs> So tell me why you're, so it, why you're interested in, um, emphasize, in basically lifting us up from our depression. <laughs> yeah, so um, there's been a lot of talk about climate change in the past few decades, but it doesn't feel like we are starting to mobilize our communities very quickly. And this is something that's really important because we know that these changes are going to happen very quickly. Um, and so one of the ideas that I have is that if we talk about climate change in a way that's hope-based and urgency-based, as opposed to this like doomsday message that we usually hear, that we might be able to more effectively talk to one another and start making bite-sized changes in climate change. So how did you get interested in this approach, other than maybe you just didn't want to see the human race go <laughs> to pop, which would be justification in itself. <laughs> yeah, um, so I got an undergraduate in environmental science uh -huh. um, and then spent some time doing education and outreach between my undergraduate and my graduate education. Uh -huh. And in that experience, I realized that people really want to talk to scientists and people are really interested in learning about what we're talking about. But sometimes those, um, those talks are, there are barriers to them based on how we communicate. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started thinking about climate change and how that might get wrapped into it. Uh -huh. So, um where are you from, Nancy? I'm from Tucson, Arizona, oh, right. so it's a little bit warmer than it is here. Yes, um, um, today that's probably a nice thing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um, how are you enjoying California? Oh, I love it, it's great. Uh -huh. With the slight exception of the weather. Like, <laughs> we were talking earlier about like moving from the East Coast and it being really nice because it's warm here. Yes. It's not warm here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I love California. The uh -huh. people are incredible here. 
So in your conversations with people about climate change and so on, what are, the, what, what are some of the other things that have surprised you where you felt like, oh, maybe I could make a difference? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, people's willingness to get involved in these issues um, uh -huh. has really made an impact on me. And I think uh, <coughs> hearing people be interested in getting involved in like climate change research or doing something in their communities or helping biodiversity has really spurred me to start thinking about what I personally can do uh -huh. a little bit more of. And what in, in these endeavors, how accurate do you th think is the information that many, say, young people have on the topic? How much sort of education as opposed to tone of communication ah. is needed? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so I spent some time in K-12 schools over the last few years, uh -huh. and it was a little sad because a lot of the K-12 students that I interacted with on a daily basis kept saying, oh, we're going to die. Oh, it doesn't even matter. Like, oh, the world is ending. Uh -huh. um, and so trying to figure out how to reach them um, is really important. And one of the ways that we can do that is by putting scientists in front of them um, yeah. and by working with educators to deliver messages in ways that can reach their students. Uh -huh. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. Yeah, thank you so much. Our sixth contestant is Pierre Chetkin. Um, Pierre is in his eighth year um, doing his PhD in the Graduate School of Education. Take it away, Pierre. So I'm a storyteller, so I'm going to share a story with you. Before the internet, before radio, before television, before the telephone, and before the telegraph, there were talking drums. Talking drums. The world's first wireless communication technology used to transmit information at a distance in a rhythmic form called drum language. Relayed from village to village, drum messages could travel 100 miles or more in a matter of an hour, with children almost always being among the first to pick up on their meaning, perhaps by virtue of the musical nature of drum communications. In fact, drum language used to be so widespread in pre-colonial Africa that it used to be like a second form of language, with nearly everybody having a drum name including, at times, even pets. Needless to say, this was a powerful and significant mode of socialization. Might seem irrelevant when you can text yourself across the world in a matter of seconds, but in the days of foot and horseback messengers, talking drums were quite the innovation. Fast forward to today, to our information society of desktop, laptop, computers, mobile phone, tablet, AR, VR, embodied interactions, the talking drum may strike us as all but an archaic and obsolete form when it comes to communication. But yet, in light of recent advances in human-computer interaction, or HCI, the talking drum may yet still get a chance to negate this sentence of obsolescence and reinvent itself once again. I present to you the drum ball, which is a digital orality system, an embodied learning environment that acts as a transducer of rhythmic input into multimodal output. In short, this is a digital talking drum. Its design and implementation is the focus of my dissertation, which sits at the, inter at the intersection of information, education, and ethnomusicology to investigate the impact this digital drum talk mode could have on the early literacy skills of children. With the drum ball, we could transform urban education by accelerating research in culturally grounded and body learning environments that blend rhythmic movement with computer interaction, allowing drum patterns to be turned into and used as letters, words, and phrases. We can mediate learning across a wide variety of subjects, reading, geography, history, drama, technology, all through the inspiration of the talking drum. Thank you.
thank you so much, Pierre. So are you able to give us a demonstration? Unfortunately, not today. Oh. <laughs> but yes, it, it's functional. Um, so how did you get interested in this? I mean, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely been an exciting project. Um, uh -huh. I'll give you the short version um, because the, you know, I'm a storyteller, so it's always a story. But um, to make it short, I was walking one day downtown UC Berkeley, uh, downtown Berkeley, and I walked by a, store, uh, a bookstore, and something uh -huh. told, told me to go in, and I walked in. Uh -huh. And I walked down the aisle, and something told me to turn down the aisle, so I turned. And there was a book, and I recognized the symbol on the book because it was a symbol, one of the Adinkra symbols from Ghana. And it's called Jinyame, which means believe in God. Uh -huh. And I picked up that book. It was a response to me. And I read it while I was taking a, a course in my, in my uh, um, early days of literacy. And in that book, which was written by an uh, author who's actually based out here, Kokomo Cloté, who's from Ghana. And he was talking about the talking drum, uh, about drums as a technology for cultivating, for unleashing the human potential and building community. And it fascinated me, and I read the whole book, and it was within that book that he was mentioning the, uh, the way that the drums were used in our cultures um, and, that, and, and the, the impact they had on children. So that's that kind of what, what made me click to deepen uh -huh. that in my studies. So have you had a chance yet to um, test some of your theories um, with children um, with specific educational goals? Yes, and um, actually launching my intervention uh, for my study uh, next month on April 19th, but I've done a couple pilots as well, and the goal is uh, on focused on letter naming and picture naming because it's, uh, it's, it's a multimodal tool, so it's connected to a, brow uh, to a website on a, a platform on the browser, and so you do the call with, with this device and you get the response to the browser. So we're looking at, uh, with, my advisor, with my advisor, Jabari Mahiri, we're looking at the, the, these applications in, for these early skills. So, very interesting. So, um, you're from Ghana, you said? My mother's from Ghana, my father's from Cameroon, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I visited Ghana last year. I awesome. very much enjoyed myself. Um, so, did you um, do your undergraduate work there, or have you been um, somewhere elsewhere since there? Or yeah, I, I, I... You actually, were you raised here? No, great question. Uh, I, I left home when I was 10, and I, I, did my, uh, I went to boarding school in France for about uh -huh. seven years. Uh, before coming to the U.S. for college, I went to Ohio Wesleyan University, uh -huh. uh, small liberal arts. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, did my first master's at the University of Chicago before coming to uh, do the master's in uh, information at UC Berkeley. Uh -huh. Well, I hope you're enjoying Berkeley. <laughs> Very much so. This, is, well, this was the place I was trying to be. It's just been a long road to get here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Pierre. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Our seventh contestant is Laura Fouquet. Laura is a master's student in the School of Public Health. Sorry. You ready? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. In the Bay Area, we see homelessness all around us. On any given night in the United States, approximately 300,000 women are homeless. Generally, we know that violence-related negative health outcomes disproportionately affect women. However, homeless and unstably housed women are especially vulnerable to experiencing violence because they may sleep on the street or in a public place. Thus, homeless and unstably housed women experience higher rates of violence than both homeless men and the rest of the population. Since my undergrad here at Berkeley, I've worked with and studied the homeless populations of Berkeley and San Francisco. For my master's thesis, I conducted an original epidemiologic analysis using data from the UCSF shadow cohort study. The study was interested in the physical and mental health of homeless and unstably housed women in the Tenderloin, the Mission, and Soma districts in San Francisco. My analysis found that the prevalence of sexually transmitted infections was significantly higher among women who recently experienced violence than women who had not. 
we also found that violence perpetrated by someone who was not a primary partner was the most common source of violence experienced by these ladies. This suggests that healthcare and social service providers' focus on primary partner violence screening completely misses the mark with this vulnerable population. So why am I doing research like this? Documenting the health realities of vulnerable, understudied populations using research can ultimately lead to policy change, such as policies to protect existing and create more affordable housing. Also, research can inform public health interventions that address the root of the problem, such as permanent supportive housing for folks experiencing homelessness, like this unit in Washington, DC. It's a great example. Unconditionally providing housing as a basic need can serve as a foundational first step towards finding a job, accessing mental health care services, and making behavioral health changes. If we, as public health professionals, take a health equity approach towards leveling the playing field and creating a more equitable society, we can reduce the prevalence of homelessness Thank you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, Laura. So um, this must be incredibly rewarding work to do. Um, what, what's, can you tell us, maybe share with us a couple of the most rewarding um, moments you've had in your work with homeless populations where you yeah. thought, Wow, I made a difference for somebody. Totally. Um, before, right now I'm in an accelerated Master of Public Health program in epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, but before this, I did my undergrad here in public health. And the way I got involved in quantitative research with this population was actually through caseworking um, with, a, with a community organization on campus called the Suitcase Clinic. It's, a, it's one of the largest undergraduate um, humanitarian organizations, and they host three weekly drop in clinics for the homeless populations of Berkeley. So you casework, um, connect, you get to know these folks, you see them everywhere on the street, like I'm riding my bike and I see Roger and I'm like, hey Roger, and then I get lunch with someone and you hear about their life, but you also connect them to like housing and employment services or like how to get Cal Fresh or these different things. And so I think the personal connections have been the most rewarding, um, but then also recognizing like um, my epistemology as a researcher and that um, doing, conducting research with this population could potentially be damaging and triggering for them as well. And so I want to like have the most respect and recognize my role of privilege mm -hmm. in it all too. So how did you get interested in this? Uh, yeah, I, I did public health here as an undergrad. Um, it's but how did you get interested in that? I got, uh, um, before, before coming to Berkeley, um, I grew up in San Diego and uh -huh. I started an event there called TEDx Youth at San Diego, so a, an independent TEDx event. And I saw a, a TED talk from an epidemiologist talking about primary prevention and the idea that um, a single vaccine or some sort of like structural intervention could, structural intervention could shift the health of the entire population rather than just helping one individual with medicine, for instance, was just life-changing to me. And so I thought, oh, I'm gonna to apply to public health schools and then Berkeley is the number one public health undergraduate program. And uh -huh. so found myself here. Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, I know that the sort of concept and establishment of navigation centers for the homeless is somewhat, sometimes quite controversial. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on them? My navigation systems, the, do you mean like apps to track? Centers where, where homeless people like shelters, can access, free meal programs. Uh, plus additional services. Yes. Yeah. Um, there, well, after working at the suitcase clinic, I had a very, um, I had a, a very like empathetic advocacy perspective um, where I just, I view technology as a way to, uh, to connect these people to services because a lot of the time if someone's housing insecure, they might also have a phone where they can look to see where the closest uh, thing is that would accept food stamps or like where the closest uh, accessible bathroom is. Um, but in San Francisco, they're doing a lot of really good work um, connecting, uh, connecting the homeless to permanent supportive housing units because they have like 7,500 homeless people and enough 
uh, permanent supportive housing beds, but just actually getting them into that um, is Making an effort uh -huh. that's happening now. Uh -huh. well, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Good luck with your work. Yeah. So our eighth contestant is Chin Chin Yu. Um, Chin Chin is in um, the third year of the PhD program in physics. If we could predict evolution, we would be able to create better treatments for microbial infections, cancer tumors, and prevent species from going extinct. However, evolution is inherently unpredictable. Random mutations create the diversity from which adaptation can act. But even if all the mutations were completely predetermined, if we evolved a population multiple times, we would still get that different species survive each time, similarly to repeatedly picking balls out of a hat and getting different results every time. Experimental studies on animal evolution are challenging because they can often take a long time to reproduce. A single animal generation takes years, and typical evolution experiments take thousands to millions of generations. I don't want to spend that long on my PhD. <laughs> on the other hand, my research using microbes as a model system takes just days to complete. Through microbial evolution experiments, we have learned that the larger a population is, the more predictable its evolution will be. Any random fluctuations get averaged out over large numbers. However, conventional microbial experiments take place in liquid environments with no spatial structure. But we know that organisms in the real world live in space, such as infections that grow on the surface of a catheter implant or on the inside of a human lung. It turns out that if we confine large microbial populations in space, even they can evolve unpredictably. My research is on understanding why that is and what changes to cellular genetic information can tune this. I have seen that cell shape can act as a tuning knob. Rod-shaped cells, such as E. coli, will compete with each other more for space than round cells, such as brewer's yeast. These spatial rearrangements cause the rod-shaped cells to scramble their fates and the fates of their offspring, leading to a less predictable outcome. By better understanding the role of spatial structure in evolution, we can begin to create more realistic pictures of systems that affect us all, such as microbial infections, cancer tumor evolution, and species extinction. And by using microbial experiments, we can precisely tune and repeat evolution experiments so that in the future, we just might be able to predict unpredictability. Thank you. Thank you, Chin Chin. So how did, how did you get into this from, um, I, it's, it's not what I consider to be physics. Yeah. So I mean, I, I've only stayed in physics instead of doing materials. Um, when, if, if there'd been interesting stuff like this, how, 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 did, how, yeah. how, did, how did you sort of get into this particular aspect of um, what you're doing? Yeah, so I've always really been interested in interdisciplinary problems. So yes. how to use um, my skills from physics to study other really interesting questions. Uh -huh. um, and I took a class uh, in undergrad that was in biophysics. Is and that, here? Awesome. that was that was not here. Um, that was at MIT. Yeah, and okay. You can mention the other places. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it really sparked my interest. And when I got to grad school, um, I worked with a couple of different professors in rotations before I chose a lab. And one of the professors that I was fortunate to have worked with was uh, my PI. And it became, uh, it was really the questions that they were asking in that group were really interesting to me. And uh -huh. I decided I wanted to study it for my PhD. So, I mean, do you think that there's actually a possibility to take a different approach from <laughs> genetic man manipulation to actually just exploring random developments to actually develop different strains of microorganisms for particular purposes. 
like to use randomness in our favor to, yes. to engineer? Yes, so, so, so that, um, you know, that there's a different approach to try and, um, you know, say, you know, develop organisms with particular characteristics. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I'm not a bioengineer, so I'm probably not the best person to ask. Um, but I think the answer is yes, that we can use randomness in our favor to um, achieve certain outcomes. Um, and our lab is actually really interested in, uh, in studying randomness for um, hopefully that purpose, uh, that uh, potential purpose eventually, to be able to use it in, say, disease treatments to, um, instead of just eradicating a, uh, a mutant resistant type right away, maybe we can be clever about this randomness and keep it uh, alive for longer so that in the future we might be able to eradicate it. Um, so I think the answer is yes, but like I said, I'm not a bioengineer, um, so they might have very different opinions. So the arrays that you show are all the same back, um, organism. What happens when you um, end up with um, a, a, an array of different microorganisms, such yeah. as in different microbiomes? Yeah. Do, um, does that affect uh, the way that I, I see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, one research question that uh, our field is fascinated with right now is the interaction of evolution with ecology, with uh -huh. ecology being when you have different organisms around, how do they interact with each other? Um, and. Uh, as a short answer, I think the, an the answer is yes. There do seem to be interactions between the two. If you have multiple species around, then it, uh, it influences evolution in a way differently. Interesting. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Our ninth contestant is Jessica Higgers. Um, Jessica is a second year master's student in development practice. Jessica. In the US, only 10% of plastic is recycled. A piece of plastic is used for about 12 minutes, yet lasts for a thousand years. Disposable foodware, which is food packaging and containers, are predominantly made out of plastic. And the average person in the US generates 500 pounds of disposable foodware every single year. And although compostable food packaging is an improvement, it still generates 67 times the greenhouse gas emissions as its reusable equivalent. So although it's a better foodware, it still is not that good. And we're in the midst of a global movement to reduce our reliance on disposable foodware. And all global movements need local solutions. Repeal is my proposed local solution. I started Repeal to create, dispos to create disposable free dining experiences on university campuses. And reusables as a service is one programmatic approach to make that happen. So at a campus cafe, a customer will order their favorite meal to go and then pay a small deposit for the use of a reusable container. They will then go and enjoy their meal wherever they wish. When done, they put their dirty container in a conveniently located bin, at which point they will be collected, scanned, and that's when their deposit will be fully refunded to the customer's account. And then the containers will be washed and redistributed back to the participating food providers. In November, I conducted a pilot at Cafe Think at Haas, and where we replaced the Reuse the disposable foodware with reusable containers for one food item. And we learned three, three very important things. First, people actually use the containers. And those that use them, 60% of the time, return the containers without any incentive. Second, all stakeholders involved were not only excited about the pilot, but were supportive of its expansion. And third, at that cafe alone, in just one month, we have the opportunity to eliminate 36,000 disposable foodware items. In, tw um, in 2019, I'm conducting two additional pilots, one on the cafe side to better understand logistics and operations, and then the other will be on the customer side to better understand education and behavior change needs. In closing, the, the world looks to the UC system for thought leadership on these large issues. And as we've seen today, we, we can bring it to them. We can bring that. Repeal is the opportunity 
to take that unique position and provide measurable change to a disposable free future. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Jessica. That yeah. was absolutely fascinating. Oh, okay. So, um, college campuses, I think, have ide idealistic and motivated <laughs> people. Yes. What happens when you start dealing with the general public? Um, so, <laughs> much yeah. as we'd like to think that we're the general yeah. public, I know that we aren't really. So, are there, are, are there, so has your pilot provided um, insight mm -hmm. that could actually inform more efficacy when you get to that stage? Certainly, certainly. One wonderful thing about a college campus is that it more or less is a closed ecosystem. So it allows us to really have control over a lot of the different levers and actors in play. And so when you do get into the general population, you don't have as much control over where people are coming and going and consuming and so forth. So it has taught us a lot that the underlying infrastructure, and so this is upstream of what the products are being created, as well as downstream of how they're being collected and sorted, that's what needs to be changed. Not necessarily the individuals, because there is so much coming and going, and so much newness and different backgrounds. It's really those two sides that need to have the, the impact. Mm -hmm. So is this a kind of recreating the model that there used to be where um, soda bottles and things weren't disposable, but customers paid a deposit? And exactly. It's just, it's just like the, um, the milk carton or like the, the glass the, milk I, I'm bottles. from a country where um, <laughs> they still have milk bottles, yes. I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah that's exactly it. So uh -huh. for, um, for this reusables as a service program, it is that you pay a deposit, but then you get it fully refunded back. So. Uh -huh. And how do you sterilize your containers? Um. Uh, uh, commercial dishwashers that are that are certified by the Department um, of Health and Safety at campus. Uh -huh. you know. Okay. And so, um, tell me a bit more about yourself. Where are you from? Oh, and I'm from the um, the very this? far lands of Marin and Sonoma County. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> um, yeah. But I went to the East Coast for college, and um, and but couldn't stay away. Clearly. <laughs> Yeah. So when you're not um, repealing and mm -hmm. so on. I love that. Um, I love what, that as a verb. What, what, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> Let's go repeal. Uh, um, what, what, do you, what do you do for recreation? Um, especially having grown up around here, you must know a lot about the, yeah. um, sort of the, the locality. Um, uh, how do you like to spend your time? I love being outdoors. Um, I think one biggest reason is that there's very little waste outdoors. The uh, environmental world has really adopted the pack in, pack out mentality, and that's really what's kind of fueled a lot of the work here. And so anything outdoors, be it um, camping, hiking, cycling, water skiing, I love doing that. Uh -huh. So Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, thank Jessica. You. Mm -hmm. And so our 10th and final contestant is um, Chandan Singh. Um, Chandan is a second year PhD student in electrical engineering and computer science. And I think he deserves special applause for having by um, the luck of the draw or otherwise, had to be the person to listen to everybody else's presentation <laughs> before he gets to give his. So um, please join me in welcoming Chandan. <laughs> Machine learning is transforming the way the world works. Every day, machine learning seeps into more and more aspects of our daily lives, whether it be deciding what we see on the internet or guiding those annoying Kiwi bots on campus all the time. <laughs> um, importantly, crucial decisions that humans always used to make, things like diagnosing disease or driving cars, are now increasingly assisted by these machine learning models. Now, the way machine learning models generally work is they look at a lot of data and they learn complex patterns from it. So if you give a model a bunch of brain scans and you tell it the associated diagnosis for each of those brain scans, it can learn to predict what that diagnosis should be for a new brain scan, even if it's never seen it before. And it does this by learning statistical regularities in the data it's seen before. Now, this is a really powerful idea. By looking at these things and learning super complex patterns, 
It can learn these things that humans could never hope to learn because of how complex they are. However, all this power comes with a very serious cost. And that cost is that these models can't explain how or why they're making their decisions. Now this is really important because in uh, critical contexts like, deci like medical decision making, we need to know when a model is going to fail, how much we can trust it, and why it's making the decision that it's making. So this problem inspired me to start a recent research project where we're trying to explain how machine learning models make their decisions. So if we consider a simple problem where, we're given, where a model tells you if some text is positive or negative, um, we can build a model that can do it really well. Then this simple black box model represents the machine learning algorithm, which takes in this text not very good and tells you that it's negative. Now the question is, how did it come to this decision? So what the algorithm that uh, I devised does is it breaks out this decision by looking at the equations underlying the model and telling you how the model felt about different parts of this input. So specifically, it gives you this kind of hierarchical tree structure that tells you how it felt about different subsets of the input sentence. So the word good in blue is pretty positive. When it combines with very, very good becomes very positive. But when you add not to it, the entire thing becomes negative. Now this kind of compositional structure allows us to see the inner workings of the black box, how it feels about different subsets of the representation. In a more serious context, we can imagine that this model, now instead of telling us if text is positive or negative, is telling us if someone it, um, using their medical scan has some kind of disease. Now instead of showing us which words were important, it'll tell us what parts of a brain scan or something similar were important for making that kind of diagnosis. And additionally, it tells us how different parts of the brain scan uh, coordinate with one another in order to finally produce the uh, diagnosis. A doctor can look at something like this and decide, is the model doing sem something sensible? And how can I learn from this model in order to make better diagnoses going forward? We hope that this work and other work trying to do interpretable machine learning and opening this black box can help machine learning models be safer and more accountable as they spread into these critical situations that have real impacts on society. Thank you, Chandan. So I have to ask you, um, you, you've actually explained a lot that I didn't know <laughs> in this area, so thank you for opening up the black box. Um, <laughs> within this sort of field of machine learning, how bro sort of broadly applicable are these principles? So you mentioned particularly medical applications. Are the principles for medical applications applicable more generally? Yeah, so this is one thing that's been really cool about the last decade of machine learning specifically, is these new algorithms, things like neural networks, are able to learn statistical regularities across a large type, like a really large variety of data sets. So things that started working by telling you, you know, is this a cat or, this is, or is this a dog in images, now work on things like text, they work on audio, they also work on medical imaging type scenarios. So they're really becoming very broadly applicable and it's a lot of magic like going on behind the scenes. So you're probably sick of answering this question, but is there a machine learning element to the software in Boeing 737 Max 8? Yeah, so... <laughs> Not the, that you're responsible, yeah, we are totally yeah. accountable. Yeah, so I mean hopefully things like this would help you find out if there were that kind of error in a machine learning system. So uh -huh. um, for what we can tell, there is some machine learning element in that system. But it isn't actually what was responsible for kind of the like negative consequences we saw. It was more of like a sensory issue. Oh, okay. Um, so that was the hardware, not the software. Yeah, more <laughs> or less. Uh, but yeah, so it's tangentially related, um, but it wasn't at fault this time. Uh -huh. So tell us about, a bit about yourself in terms of how you got interested in this field um, and kind of where you're from and where you did your undergraduate work. Yeah, so I'm from Virginia. I went to undergrad at the University of Virginia and I was actually originally interested in the brain. So the brain is like another super complicated black box. It does all these magical things. We can see, we can hear and understand things. Um, and neuroscientists really are trying to understand this black box and that's where my, a lot of my background came in. Um, the machine learning side is more about, you know, like how can we make this black box do things? And I think uh, as these machine learning algorithms came more and more to resemble a lot of things that we see in neuroscience, it became a more interesting field for me to try to look at, okay, what have these representations actually learned and how can we use tools from neuroscience to try to understand what's going on in these models? Uh -huh. So how do you enjoy um, California and Berkeley compared to the University of Virginia? Yeah, so it's great. Actually, I really like Virginia as well. Probably uh, the second best okay. state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, California is great. Um, I'm a big nature person and California uh -huh. is like maybe the best nature. We have, you know, like Yosemite Valley, 
Uh, we have Silicon Valley and Death Valley and <laughs> Napa Valley. We just have a lot yeah, of there's, varied there's, valleys. Each, each with a very interesting yeah. sort of fauna and local population. Yeah, <laughs> so a lot of cool stuff and yeah, very similar uh -huh. areas. Oh, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, um, our judges have done their work, and we now move on to the People's Choice balloting, and I believe that some instructions are about to appear. Is that right? Excellent, good. Okay, um, so we have, um, now you have the opportunity, the information is there, to follow the instructions um, so that you can go to your phone or your laptop and cast your ballot for the People's Choice Award. Our contestants are leaving. I think they're disqualified for do, from, from doing that. Um, so these awards, are, are these, this um, is going to be open for 15 minutes. So um, you might want to just make sure that you can cast your ballot now. Um, once you, if you have any problems, um, please raise your hand. This room is sometimes used as a classroom. It, you wouldn't be the first person to raise your hand in here. And um, somebody will come and assist you. And then once you've voted, um, I'd invite you to come and um, join me in light refreshments in the lobby. Um, I know Jessica's going to be really disappointed. I don't think that we have the repeal stuff there. So you will just have to slum it with compostable, I think. Um, stuff. Um, it's the next best thing. But first of all, please make it, uh, cast your votes for the people's choice. Um, and then we will be um, reconvening here, this is very important, at five o'clock sharp, which is when we will be announcing the winners. So thank you so much for your attention. Okay, um, so this is probably related to the gerrymandering talk. Um, you know, sort of it, it, the a saying goes, vote early and often. You can only vote for one individual. <laughs>
right, so um, welcome back everybody for the moment that everybody has been waiting for. And um, it's, it's been rather topical today, but we could use a, a drum roll. Um, as <laughs> okay. <laughs> And without question, um, we're crea creating community here. And so the um, People's Choice winner is Chin Chin Yu for predicting unpredictability <laughs> in evolution. So we're giving nominal certificates. We will be settling up with the winners later, and then they'll get a proper certificate that's signed. But anyway, for the, for the, for the purposes of the photography. Okay, the second place winner is Yifan Li for the fast track through photosynthesis. Big excitement, um, the, and the first place winner, um, in addition to the certificate, has a nominal check here. And again, we'll send a proper one later. <laughs> so uh, the, um, the finalist, um, the person who will represent Berkeley at the system-wide grad slam competition is Nancy Freitas from Microbes <laughs> in the Arctic. <laughs> As we wrap things up, um, I would like to um, have a special round of applause for all of the student contestants. It is <laughs> During the break, so many people came up to me and um, commented on the incredible quality and professionalism of all of your presentations. They were fantastic. And um, you're so poised and um, did such a great job. Um, and I know because all of the talks were so great, um, we deserve, um, we ha absolutely have to give another round of applause to our judges. <laughs> because I know that their job was really, really hard. Um, people thank me for doing the emceeing, but it's not nearly as difficult as actually judging, so I'm so grateful to them. Um, I'd also like to thank the um, Advisory Committee for Graduate Student and Postdoctoral Scholar um, Professional Development, who did all the first round judging. Um, and also, um, a special note of thanks to um, Joe for coming back. And um, <laughs> speaking so eloquently of the importance of communication. Um, and it really is important um, that those of us who um, are scholars and know a lot about important matters are able to actually communicate the importance of our learning to society. Um, and society benefits enormously from that. So um, I thank you so much for that very compelling talk, Joe. Um, I'd also like to extend incredibly deep thanks to all of my colleagues in the graduate division who worked so hard for this event. Um, the main role was played by Linda Louie um, with assistance from Andy Son behind the ca camera, Liz Mores, who's cheering us on and kept on holding up the pieces of paper to tell us that it was time to move on. 
um, Larissa Chonsangave, um, and um, also our um, professional development liaisons helped, particularly uh, Arthi Jobinj and Tanis Leonardis, um, who helped coach the students so that um, they were putting their best foot forward um, in the presentation. So thank you so much to everybody. Um, this is a great um, sort of afternoon. And um, I've particularly enjoyed uh, hosting this in the Sibley Auditorium. For those who don't know me, I'm a professor in engineering. I've actually taught quite a lot of classes from right here, um, although I've noticed that since then they've changed the AV display here, so I couldn't do anything to mess things up, which is probably a good thing. Um, but thank you so much for everybody for um, your support and attention. And another round of applause to our amazing contestants. Thank you.